so what are we going to speak on today so coming on today's session with the unlocking of the economy we are seeing a number of businesses slowly inching towards normalcy at the heart of the matter lies the fact that if you are running a sound business with sharp focus on generating profit you would have a much better shot at coming out of this crisis with least disruption or you may even emerge stronger so our guest for speaker for today is a leading voice on business for profit Herman Simon is the founder and honorary chairman of Simon Kuchar and Partners the global leader in price consulting with more than 1500 employees and 39 offices on all continents Simon's got 40 books that have been published in 27 languages he is the only german think uh, german in the thinker 50 hall of fame of the globally leading management thinkers and since 2005 he's been consistently voted the most influential living management thinker in german speaking countries he's an acclaimed speaker on top of globalization profit orientation corporate strategy and market leadership he has received numerous awards and honorary doctorates from multiple countries in china the herman simon business school is named after him so if he talks about pricing and profit the world listens to him and today you have a chance to do so on this very exclusive platform must to speak thank you very much herman for joining us today it's such a pleasure to have you with us on this show hello rakesh hello india i'm glad to be with you it's our pleasure herman and and my apologies for this papa uh i was speaking and i didn't realize that i was talking to myself all this while but i guess no, we are right right now fine yes so okay herman so without wasting much time i'll dive into the subject quickly and start with asking you a personal question and my question is that why did you choose to focus on pricing and profit as a subject of your work because there are you know lot trendier things consultants love to talk about so is there a back story to your decision here that our audience uh, should know of actually chance plays a big role in life i had a very quantitative uh, theoretic education in economics at the university of bonn and i chose pricing as the subject of my doctoral dissertation but then i had the ambition to apply these theories to practice and we started small and today we are a global leader in price consulting so it's uh, rooted in my education and uh, the very theoretical quantitative education i got super sir simon and i'm sure our audience are all ears to listen to uh, the years of research and the work that you have done and you've been sharing so openly with so many people across the globe so let's start with basics uh, simon uh, the first and the most basic question how do you define profit and how important is the subject of profit uh, in this current pandemic situation right now and after the pandemic is over there's only one true and simple definition of profit profit is what the owner of a company can keep after he or she has fulfilled all obligations towards employees suppliers banks and the government only that is true profit So Simon, uh, there are multiple other definitions of profit. What do you have to say about that? There's economic profit, there is social profit, and we've seen businesses, uh, uh, you know, using uh, these different profit definitions uh, to talk about uh, the purpose that with which the business operates. So, what about those definitions? What about uh, you know sustainability as a topic when you speak of profit? True profit is usually quite low. That's why companies have been very creative in blowing up the figures. One is EBIT earnings before interest and taxes. The other is EBIT DA where they add um, depreciation and then there are very new creative ways uh, used by companies like WeWork or Groupon where they are even adding customer acquisition costs marketing expenditures etc and report that as a kind of operating profit but that's not profit profit is only what the entrepreneur 
can keep. Economic profit is a different benchmark, a higher benchmark, so to say, which is very meaningful. Economic profit is a profit which exceeds the cost of capital. So you could say that's a kind of true entrepreneurial profit because it shows what the entrepreneur makes more than he would get in the market in capital markets with the same investment so if somebody does not exceed the cost of capital he should better invest his money in capital markets instead of laboring in his own company so economic profit i think is a tough measure but it's a really substantial indicator of profitability of a company fair point you make simon there um simon so this crisis like other crises of the past has brought for brought to for the fact that uh, you know high leverage companies are often the most vulnerable in these times and yet a few can do without it so first off is this a fact from your research and secondly um, you know understanding that debt is not bad per se what is with these companies that they miss uh, to put together that makes them less resilient or in in these times of course crises are the hour of truth and profit plays an even more important role under crisis conditions than in normal times that holds both with hindsight and with uh, a look into the future from hindsight if a company has been profitable in the past it has been able to build up reserves and is strong enough to survive a crisis companies who have not been very profitable in the past don't have these reserves so they are vulnerable and many will disappear i think that in the next few months we will see a, a, a tsunami of insolvencies and and bankruptcies with regard to the future of course after the crisis profit will again be very important because many companies have to take on additional debt during the crisis and only if they are profitable they will be able to pay back that debt and get an, a good financial ratio between equity and debt again so you could say profit is always important but in the crisis before and after the crisis it's super important you could also define profit as the cost of survival i think that's a, a good understanding cost of survival if you don't make profit you don't uh, secure your survival yes uh, so uh, i know simon you would love to talk about price and value uh, but before we come to that question uh, i will talk about valuation because this was also a subject of um one of our sessions a couple of weeks ago with professor ashwath damodaran uh, who was on the show earlier talking about valuations of the company now um, the question that i have in my mind taking a leap from what we heard then uh, the, there are companies that make colossal losses year on year with no line of sight uh, to their economic profit but they have unbelievable valuations now you are an evangelist of business for profits but the advocates of valuation are willing to ignore the compelling argument that you make so how do you reconcile these two theories and what is the whole truth to get the valuation do you really need to chase profits or you know that's that's possibly not the only way to do some of the most uh, famous examples of companies which have not been profitable for years and still got a high valuation are amazon and salesforce.com what is different with them first they were growing continuously year after year so obviously they had bright prospects for the future the second is unlike for instance we work and some of the younger companies they were not burning much cash recently in the last 2 years companies like we work and a couple of others have burned more than 20 billion dollars of cash amazon 
never had a negative cash position of more than $1 billion. So for the investors, there was the prospect that this company would eventually become profitable. And it has become profitable two, three years ago. So we should not apply a short-term view in valuing a company. Short-term profit is not the critical criterion, but long-term profitability. Can we expect that a company becomes profitable in long term? And that is certainly the case for Amazon and Salesforce and Oracle. So these companies are justifiably highly valued. But some of the other companies whose cash burn is too big and whose prospects are highly uncertain will not get the same high valuation. As we, we saw it, I mentioned WeWork. WeWork was uh, two years ago valued at 48 billion. Today, it's uh, rather 10 billion or less. So theoretically, uh, Herman, if, uh, if if WeWork had access to unlimited capital, do you think they would have been in the same position? You have to convince and you have to be honest. We just had a big scandal in Germany, Wirecard, which uh, had risen to the highest league of publicly listed companies. And uh, it was all uh, cheating and the company collapsed. I pulled out uh, yesterday from the DAX index. So these things happen, but you have to consistently prove that you can make profits in the future. The goal should be long-term profitability, not short-term profit. That is the key. And I think that is also the, the essence of discussions about profit and profit maximization. Many people criticize profit orientation of companies. And under this, I think, lies a misunderstanding. You can criticize short-term profit uh, maximization but long term is the only meaningful goal for a company. And that's more or less identical with the shareholder value concept. Fair enough. Uh, Sajana, I think that brings uh, to debate a very important question. Then what is long term and what is short term? Does that change uh, with the evolution of the business? Does that change with the industry? You know, what are the drivers of this long and the short term? Yeah. Looking at this. First, Rakesh, that's a very good question. <laughs> and uh, we don't know what long term and short term is. Uh, the famous uh, John Maynard Keynes said, in the long term, we are all dead. That's certainly true. And uh, of course, long term means something different for uh, the pharmaceutical industry, where you have to develop new products which takes usually 10 years until you can sell them. And then you have typically 20 years of patent protection. So you have actually only 10 years to get your investment back. In short-term oriented sector like fashion, long-term, maybe one year, um, two years, three years, you, you cannot predict today who will be the the most fashionable brand in sneakers in three or five years from now. So you have to develop an understanding of what short and long term means according to the conditions in the industry. And there's no sharp line. But uh, I would say for, for no company, a quarter is long term. A quarter is always short term. Yeah, that's always an interesting uh, debate, uh, Simon. There, uh, Simon, I'm. Uh, you know, from from what I read from your work, you've done a lot of uh, studies, and there is empirical analysis done on the, um, you know, margins companies make in different countries. And I also know that you've sort of, uh, you know, surveyed people on the street, asking them what their perception of the profits and what actually the margins the companies were earning. So I'm not sure whether it was done for India, uh, also. But nevertheless, it would be interesting to hear about that. Yeah, I, I haven't done a survey in India, but that would indeed be interesting. Uh, I have numbers, for instance, for Germany, where 
people in the street think that net profit margin is 23%. The reality is 3.4% over many years. In the US, the difference is even bigger. People think that companies make 31% net. The reality is about 5%. And the record holder is Italy, where the public thinks that 38% are the net profit margins. That's after costs, all costs and all taxes. And the reality is also about 5%. So obviously, uh, normal people have no idea about real profitability, real returns on, on, on sales. And that's strange why that is so. I, I don't have a clear explanation. Now, the second part of your question, yes, profits are very different from country to country. Um, India is actually quite good with an average of 9% uh, over uh, many years. Uh, the worst, the lowest country is Japan with 2.4%. And Germany is also not very good with 3.4%. The US is at about 4.5%. Uh, what you can say with regard to countries that emerging countries usually have a higher margin, which I attribute to the higher risks, the higher volatility. We see that often uh, countries like uh, Brazil or Argentina uh, run into real problems. So the higher margin in these countries reflects the higher, higher risk. On the average, across uh, many countries, we have a net profit margin of about roughly 5%. Right. So, Simon, you um, you know, there are three drivers of profit that you've mentioned. Uh, the question that I have in mind is, uh, uh, you know, how much of significance does scale hold? So, generally speaking, uh, do large companies uh, make more profit? Are they more profitable? Or, you know, from your research, you've seen different answers emerging. Yeah. Large companies are generally not more profitable. I, I just uh, got the new numbers for the Fortune Global 500, the 500 biggest companies in the world. And they had very two good years in 2019 and 2018, where they made just over 6%. But they also have had bad years. For instance, in 2009, they made only 4.1%. So they are about average. There's always a bell curve, a distribution, and even many of them are not earning their cost of capital. Um, I think the perception of the public is strongly guided by some superstars, especially the new internet digital companies, uh, Apple, Google, Facebook, who have profit net profit margins uh, of over 20 percent so they are really extreme compared to the average but there's not a big difference between profits of large and smaller companies also among the smaller companies um, you have uh, profit stars for instance in germany we have uh, a category which i call hidden champions these are global market leaders which are not known in the public. Usually mid-sized companies say with sales between $100 million and um, $5 billion. And they are three times more profitable than the German average. So you have very profitable companies in all countries and you have all so very low profit companies in all countries and in all size categories. Great, Simon, I think you, uh, you've you touched upon hidden champions and uh, uh, something that I happened to read a bit about, and I'm sure our audience will, would find it very useful to, to know a little bit more about uh, these hidden champions. So what makes them so special? And if you've come across any of those uh, in India, um, you know, uh, that would be great to know as an example. But if not, from yeah. your experience, it'll be just good um, to know. I identified over the last 30 years about 3,500 of these hidden champions in the world. 
They are defined as follows. Top three in the world, revenue less than $5 billion, and little known in the public. And um, the biggest number is in Germany. Actually, the hidden champions are the backbone of the German economy. But I also found a couple in India, just to give you um, two examples. Uh, one is SL Propac from uh, Mumbai. They are the global leader in, uh, in containers for toothpaste. Uh, they, they have uh, manufacturing in 45 countries. And a very modern one is the Indian Institute of uh, which makes they, they are the biggest producer of vaccines and uh, they, they will also enter the production of uh, Corona vaccine in the next uh, couple of months or weeks. They are the number one in the world in the production and manufacturing of vaccines. So you have hidden champions in, in all countries in very different fields. And their strategies are characterized by three aspects. First, to the ambition to be the best, to become the global leader in their field. How can they achieve that? By focusing. Only focus leads to world class. But focus makes the market small. How do they make it big? And that's the third factor, by globalizing. So ambition to be the best. Focus and globalization are the pillars of the success of the hidden champions. Great. Um, okay, so Simon, I'm gonna. I've got some questions from audience, but uh, just one last question uh, before I take the questions from uh, from our audience, and I'm gonna ask you about price and value. The price and value are two sides of the same coin, and Yes. We know value means different things to different people, right? So, so how do you show value that takes attention away from the price from a business perspective? Yeah. As I said, uh, my company, Simon Kutcher and Partners, is a global leader in price consulting. But actually, our main concern is value or more precisely value to customer or even more precise perceived value to customer. The willingness of a customer to pay depends on his or her perception of the value. If the customer perceives a higher value, he or she is willing to pay more than for a competitive product. If the perceived value is lower, your price has to be lower. Otherwise, people will not buy your product. And actually, that's a very simple equation, but if everybody who listens now takes this equation home, they have learned a lot. Price has to equal to reflect value. And it's actually a very old truth. The, the Romans who uh, reigned Europe 2,000 years ago and their language was Latin. And in Latin, they have the same word for price and value. It's pretium. Precious is from that word. So pretium equals price equals value. And our challenge as consultants and the challenge of each, each company is to deeply understand the value which the customer perceives. And this value is driven by many factors. Of course, quality, service, friendliness, Branding, brand is a very important factor. Distribution, durability. So you have many factors and we try to quantify these factors and to come up with a number of the value. Let me give you an example. A couple of years, Porsche introduced a new model, the Cayman. The Cayman is a hard top Top, uh, which was derived from the convertible Boxster. Industry practice is that the hard top is 10% lower in price than the convertible. So we measured the value all over the world of the new Cayman model, and we came out with a result which was 
10% higher than the price of the convertible Boxster. And we had a courageous CEO at that time, Wendelin Wiedeking, who said, okay, I go for this price. It's totally contradictory to industry practice, but I'm convinced that your value measurement is right. He went for the price and he even sold a little more than we had predicted. So you, this example shows how important it is to understand the value and to quantify it. Price is a number and you have to know the number for your value. Otherwise, it's, it's guesswork or uh, you, you are operating in the fog. You must know the value and derive the price from the value and not the price from cost or competitive prices or whatever uh, rule of thumb you have. I think it's a very, very important point, uh, Simon, that you made. Um, and for our audience who are tuned in, uh, you must uh, uh, take a look at Confessions of the Pricing Man. I think there's a lot that you've spoken about over there, and I found it very, very interesting when I went through that, uh, Simon, on this price versus yeah. value uh, debate. So, so there the, is a question. the real specialists, I even have a much bigger book, 600 pages, which came out last year. It's called Price Management, Strategy, yeah. Analysis, Decision, Implementation. But I would like to add one more point on the profit drivers. The formula is quite simple. Profit equals price times sales volume minus cost. So the question is, which of the three profit drivers, and there are only three, is the most effective with regard to profitability? And there we have a clear answer. If you can improve each of the profit drivers, by 1%, what happens to profit? If you can increase price by 1% without losing volume, and that's possible for such a slight price increase, the profit will increase by 10%. So we have a multiple of 10 for price profit. The multiple for cost is six, if you can cut cost by 1%, your profit will increase by 6%. And the multiple for sales volume is only 4. If you can increase sales volume by 1%, your profit will typically increase by 4%. Why is the multiple for sales volume so low? Because with sales volume, your costs are increasing. That's what we call marginal cost. So the cost increase typically eats up 60% of the uh, revenue increase so that only 10 minus 6, only 4% profit increase remain. So in summary, price is the most effective profit driver with a multiple of 10. Cost is second with a multiple of 6. And sales volume is third with a multiple of 4. That's possibly the simplest and the most meaningful uh, definition here uh, from Herman Simon. And, and it's an interesting one here, uh, uh, Simon, is a question on exactly what you just spoke of. And it's specific to an industry. Uh, what are the drivers of pricing in financial services business? And uh, second question to this is, how can you command premium or higher than average prices if you're a mid-sized company in mid-market uh, you know, when cost leadership is not your strong point. So yeah. if it's a consumer business, competition is intense, and you're not the cost leader, then how do you really uh, command a higher price? Or yeah. Higher yeah. Price? To start with the issue of a higher price, you can only command a higher price, is price if you offer higher value. Where does the higher value come from? It can come from innovation. It can come from speed. Uh, for instance, Amazon in Germany is, is excellent in speed. You order something in the evening, you get it the next day. No, one, no other uh, e-commerce company can, can match that. It can come from branding, as I said. It can come from a closer personal customer relationship. I think that in financial services is a key factor why 
uh, am I loyal to certain banks? Because I have a very good relationship to the account manager, to the guy who takes care of me. I would say the service as such is very, very similar, does not create higher value, but the personal relationship can create higher value so that you are hesitant to change your vendor. Um, so the root goes back to the question, where can I create higher value? Where can I differentiate myself? And there, a, a very important slogan, find out what everybody else is doing and then do it differently. Of course, that's not an answer what differently means, but only if you do it differently, you can create incremental value compared to your competitors. And if that's not possible, you have to be realistic. You, you cannot increase the price or charge a higher price. You may have to, to, to accept a lower price. Everything else would be an, an illusion. So it all goes back to a very difficult issue understanding the value, understanding your customer. That's a great one there. There's a follow through question from Rajat uh, Herman and, and I think uh, from financial services, this question is about e-commerce and discounts and you spoke of Amazon. So discounts and price offs are time tested tools for driving sales, but they also have an impact on margin. So uh, in your opinion, uh, what are, especially in the retail driven markets, what are the better ways to establish uh, you know, right leadership or profit uh, leadership? And how do you get off this vicious circle once you start giving discounts? Uh, fundamentally, the, the relationship between price and volume and market share is not different for e-commerce. But you have certain uh, options which do not exist in the in the old in the in the physical world one is it's very easy to run tests so what we often do in e-commerce companies since we do not know what the optimal price is we have to find it out we run tests with different prices and see how the sales volume and the market share react this is extremely valuable information for this purpose and of course, I'm, I'm skeptical about unreflected discounting. It may drive up your sales volume, but that's not the relevant outcome. The relevant outcome is what does it do to your margin and to your profitability. And if you do a, 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 an honest calculation there, you will see very often that with the discounts, you are actually ruining your margins and your profitability. And you are educating your customers to buy only if the product is discounted, which is another long-term hazardous effect of, of uh, heavy discounting. So be cautious with discounting. If possible, do test and find out what the optimal combination of price and, and sales is. And uh, then in the internet, it's easier to implement uh, many, many different uh, price innovations. Over in the last 10 years, we have had more innovation in pricing than in the last 200 years. And most have become possible through the internet. Let me give you a couple of examples. Premium, where you offer a basic version for free and the customer pays for a premium version. Flat rate. Flat rates have become possible because very often the marginal cost of internet services are zero. So adding an additional customer does not increase your costs. You have pay as you go services where you pay for something, you use it, and uh, then you don't pay if you don't use it. Uh, so a very important difference here is say between e-commerce with physical products and e-commerce with digital products, the marginal costs 
uh, the marginal costs are often zero for digital products and um, are not zero for non-digital products. And you have to understand this difference. It's very important for your profitability. All right, Arman, this is a, I think there's an interesting question. I think a couple of people have asked this question, so I'm trying to rephrase all those questions into one. And I would take Ajit's question is that, you spoke of uh, uh, you know companies making lower profit uh, because of the cost position or something that they're not doing in terms of showing value to the customer. So, and you've been working with companies across the globe. So, how would you advise them? Um, by them, I mean companies which are facing the situation while they're generating volumes, but they're not making enough profits. Yeah, yeah. How would you advise them? Where should they start from yeah. if they have to fix this problem? You, you have to look at all three profit drivers. So price, sales volume, and cost. And find out where the root of your low profitability is. It can be in each of them. If you have a reasonable unit margin, but you don't sell enough, you will not be very profitable. If you have high sales volume, but your margin is low, you will not be very profitable. Now, is the margin low because your costs are too high or your price is too low? So you have to go to the root of the problem. And if you look at uh, the superstars in profitability, they have got all three profit drivers right. Let's consider Apple or Google. They have high sales volume, high numbers of customers. They have a high price. The Apple price is average Apple price is twice or higher than the average Samsung price. And they have low marginal costs. So this is, of course, a dream constellation. High price, high volume, low marginal cost. At the lower end of profitability, you have the opposite. Companies with high costs, relative to the costs, high, low prices, and small sales volume. That is the killer. And the only way to improve your situation is to find out where the wheel is you have to turn, which lever is most effective. If you don't have a value advantage, you cannot increase prices. If your costs are too high relative to the value you offer, you must get your costs down. If you don't have good distribution, not a sales organization, and your volume is too low in spite of a good product, you have to improve your distribution, your sales force, your sales volume. So go back to the roots and find out where the true root of your profit problem is. And very often, this is quite easily observable. When you look at the numbers, you see it quite, quite uh, quickly. Simon, we see, uh, you know, businesses invariably because they have quarterly earnings pressure and the leaders are always uh, under pressure to show results and therefore, uh, you know, focus on quarterly. Um, that also sort of uh, presses the businesses to talk more and more about efficiencies and efficiencies, right? Uh, but we know that efficiency alone is not going to drive profit. So the question that I, I, I have uh, from Sridhar here is that, what about, uh, what about people? What about teams? What about the human effort in this whole paradigm when business is focusing on generating long-term profits? What are your views on that? Uh, of course, behind all these observable economic indicators, price, volume, market share, costs, marginal costs, fixed costs, are humans, employees, customers who determine the outcome. And if we look at the case of the hidden champions, that is quite interesting. Why are they so successful? One point is the leaders. They have very, very strong, long-term oriented leaders. 
But let me talk a little more, uh, more uh, about the employees. The employees are highly qualified and motivated. They pay a lot of attention to continuing education. The loyalty of the employees is very high. The annual turnover rate of the employees of the German hidden champions is 2.4%. The German average is 7.3%. So the turnover rate is only one third. This marks excellent companies. And the tenure, the average tenure of the CEOs is 20 years. So we, we, we find the explanation of the success in the market in the qualification, in the motivation, in the loyalty of the employees and the leaders. It always goes back to these sources of success or failure, people. Yes, very well said. Uh, Simon, a shout out to our audience. There are lots and lots of questions that we are getting. We've got another 12 minutes or so with Simon. Please keep your questions coming in. Who knows, you're going to be um, one of the two lucky winners. OK, Simon, I'll just dive into this. The very interesting question. I can't help but pick that up over the others. This is from Mahesh, and it's a very direct question to you. Um, and, and Mahesh said, I'm an entrepreneur who is looking to start a venture in these times in the space of online education. What would be your advice to me? A new venture in the space of online education. Um, first, I think competition is uh, very intense and tough in this sector. So you have to offer something special. What is your unique selling proposition? You can, you can call it. And then your competence in two uh, factors is decisive. First, how do you reach your customers? Are you very good at search engine optimization and all the competencies you need to reach an, a big audience on the internet? And the size of the audience is very important because your marginal costs will be zero or close to zero. The other side is, do you have high competencies in developing the material, the teachers, whether it's uh, persons appear on the screen or whether it's other methods? So are you very good? If, if these two things are OK, I think you have a very good chance. And uh, maybe even during the crisis, because people have more time to devote to education than during times of, of boom and high employment. But perhaps one additional uh, suggestion, uh, you could think of a, of a of a freemium model or temporary freemium model, I think you should not uh, enter the market with too high prices, but find a solution that you prove how good you are and then later on have a higher, higher price level. Entering with a high price could be detrimental to the idea. Fair point, others. I mean, I hope Mahesh, you found that uh, useful and this is in line with how you were thinking about it. Uh, OK, Simon, I've got a bunch of questions, at least three here, on the topic which you briefly touched upon. Uh, so I guess uh, I would request you to delve a little deeper. And I'll pick, uh, I'll make two questions out of these three. So from Shraddha Panikar, um, you spoke extensively about profits, and that's your domain expertise. Uh, so Shraddha wants to know. What about topics like sustainability, inclusion? Are they not the drivers of long-term profits for organizations, especially uh, organizations that are market leaders? And uh, uh, another question which you can possibly answer along with it is, um, um, yeah, around innovation. So, what if you if you take profit as the main KPI? How do you drive innovation and find investments for future? So maybe mm -hmm. we can take and innovation together. Yeah. Uh, let me first talk a little about sustainability, inclusion, uh, environmental, 
issues, etc. I, I think they are part of the framework under which we have to operate. And of course, with long-term orientation, which I propagated, only sustainability and adhering to the values of the society is a good strategy. If you exploit the environment, if you produce unnecessary waste, if you pollute uh, the air, you may have a, a short-term profit advantage because it saves costs, but you will fail in the long term. So it essentially leads back to the issue of long-term orientation, not short-term profit maximization. And if you have a long-term objective and vision, I think these aspects of the framework in which we operate and the profit goal are not in conflict, but are consistent. And this relates again to value. I talked a lot about value because people value these aspects more and more. 30 years ago, I had a discussion with a large automotive manufacturer, a famous brand, and they already had ideas to make cars more environmentally friendly, but they say the customer is not willing to pay for it. So we, we cannot afford it, drives our cost up. That is, I think, different today. Still, there's a lot of lip service on the side of customers, but still the willingness to honor sustainability, inclusion, social values is higher today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And this leads me to your second question, innovation. Of course, you have to find a balance. You could say, I, I maximize my innovation by spending 20% uh, of my revenue this year on research and development. That could would probably ruin the company. The average for the hidden champions is, by the way, 6%, and that's twice what the average of, of German companies is industrial companies is. But normally you need innovation in 95% in, in of all markets, you need innovation to survive because nothing is standing still. So you have to spend money on innovation that reduces your short-term profit, but it guarantees your long-term profitability and your survival. That's very similar, um, Rakesh, to your question about short and long-term orientation, where we don't have a, a clear line, but we know when we talk about it, we know what we mean. No, that's fair enough, uh, Simon. I think we're time for a couple of more questions. Um, OK, this one is from Rajendra. And uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Simon, about price having the largest impact on the profits more than the other two drivers. Uh, but what Rajendra wants to know that a company may not always be in a position to exploit that given their competitive advantage or the landscape they may be operating in. But cost is something that they can control. So from your experience of the work that you've done in so, with so many companies and leaders, where do you find companies should attack the cost? Where you see uh, cost exuberance or uh, you know overspending usually that you have seen happening in the organization? So where should they start from? So that's an interesting experience of the corona crisis. <laughs> what we have seen is that uh, in good times, we have a lot of costs for activities which are not really required. We, we uh, accumulate fat in the organization. So I think a, a positive effect of the crisis will be that organizations become lean, leaner and, and, and shut off some activities which are not really needed. Um, concerning the, the price, my experience is that many, if not most managers, are afraid of the price. Why? Because changing the price creates a lot of uncertainty. 
if you increase the price, you don't know how many customers you are going to lose. If you cut the price, you are not sure how many, how much more you will sell. Whereas many of things that they have better control of costs, more effective control of, of, of costs, and to a certain degree also of sales volume by pushing the sales organization, etc. So one problem with price increases especially is the fear of managers. And how can you deal with this fear? Only by, by getting more solid information. As I said, if you are on the internet, you can test. Otherwise, you can, you can ask some experts. You can do some studies with customers to reduce the uncertainty and through that, the fear of managers to touch the price. And I, I hold that many companies are not charging the price which they could afford to charge. That's not a difference of, of 10 or 20%, but maybe of 1, 2, 3%. And as I said, a difference of 1% without losing volume increases profit by 10% in a typical industrial company. Okay, so uh, thank you, Simon, for that answer. Uh, again, an interesting question from David Emanuel. Um, uh, so David wants to know that what is your view of the seven P's of marketing? Uh, since you also teach marketing, I, uh, I understand. The seven P's of marketing in context of what you mentioned about value. So I think what David is trying to say is that price is one of them. And you spoke of value for customer. Value is everything that seven P's of marketing embodies, right? So what's your view on yeah. that? I, I'm not sure that I know what the seven Ps are. I usually know the four Ps introduced by my friend Philip Kotler, the, the marketing guru. But um, each of the Ps, be it four or be it seven, is a potential value driver. Even the price is a value driver. Think of luxury products. There, the price indicates value. If you are uncertain of quality as a customer, you may buy the product which is uh, more expensive because you trust that it has higher quality. So each promotion, brand, or whatever the piece are is a potential value driver. Of course, the product is still, in most cases, the main value driver. It's quality, it's durability, it's design. Great, Simon. So last two questions. And the second last one is that uh, you work with so many leaders across the globe, different businesses, different countries. Uh, and you've sort of interacted with uh, many, many uh, big leaders in industry. So what, according to you, is leadership, Simon? And who is a leader? I don't know what leadership is and nobody knows this. Even one of the most prominent academic researchers on leadership, Warren Bennis, said, we still don't know why people follow certain leaders and why they do not follow other leaders or other people. So it seems that there is a deep secret in the phenomenon of leadership. And it's certainly not the same as extroversion or introversion. I've seen leaders who are not good communicators, who speak very little, but are very effective in their, in their leadership. Um, I would say again, when you meet a leader, you see a leader, you know, he. He is one or she is one, but you hardly can say why or define it. That's my experience with many leaders. And I must say, there are not that many true leaders I have met. I've met very uh, many people across all continents in, in, in many countries. But the number of people who truly impressed me is, is very limited. It's a very small number. So part A to that question, Simon, what stands out in those people, if I may ask? 
who managed to impress you? I would say they fill the room. Let me give you two examples of people who impressed me most. Uh, one is the former Cardinal of Cologne, Cardinal Höfner. I met him for the first time when I was a visiting professor in Tokyo because he was kind of a, of a tutor of the Archdiocese of Tokyo. And uh, when he came into the room, the atmosphere in the room changed. It was simply, simply different. And the same happened with Mickey Lee in Korea. She is a granddaughter of the founder of Samsung. And we were sitting at a dinner table and she came into the room. She's heavily impaired, but with her brother founded a very large uh, company outside Samsung. And the atmosphere in the room changed. Something was different. But don't ask me what was different. So these were two of the leaders who impressed me most. One I guess from, the, from the, the Catholic Church, the other one from the business world. Yes, I'm, I'm sure all of us will know one when we see one or meet one. I describe so. a few more in my autobiography, which will soon come out in English under the title, Many Worlds, One Life from Farmhouse to Global Stage. I am a, a son of a small farmer somewhere in a remote region in Germany. And uh, I think meeting leaders is one of the most interesting experiences of my life. Awesome, Simon, we'll wait for the book to come out and for us to lay our hands on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to uh, share my feedback, if that is of any use. Let me, let me mention one more little, uh, little note. I also met some of the top politicians uh, of the world, for instance, Gorbachev from, from the Soviet Union or Clinton. Compared to the two other people I just described, they did not impress me very much. <laughs> I'm not surprised about that, Simon. <laughs> OK, Simon, uh, last question. Uh, any final? message for our audience uh, there are a lot of people who are early in their careers and they are uh, in this pandemic situation which is unprecedented they're possibly thinking about how should they navigate their career for future and for a lot of our business owners yeah. So yeah. any any word of advice or any last word for them that you want to share um, my, my most important advice is be yourself find out what what you are what you really want to do and then apply the strategy of Satan champions. Be ambitious to become world class, ideally the best in, in your field. Focus. Don't get distracted. And then in the modern world, globalize. And, and that is my own career. I come from a small farm. I developed the ambition to become the best in pricing. We focused on pricing, we globalized. So I can say from a, a farm boy from Germany, it works. And I'm not super intelligent. Uh, I just stay tuned and adhere to these simple principles. Be ambitious, focus, globalize. Awesome, Simon. That reminds me of one of our first few sessions we did with, uh, I think, Nireyal. Um, and he wrote this book, Indistractable, and he spoke extensively about focus. So. You know, that's sort of joining the threads here. Two great thought leaders of our time speaking about uh, how focus can drive things for, for all of us and, and uh, you know, help us achieve our ambitions. So with that, uh, as much as I want this session to go on, Simon, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. We deeply, deeply appreciate uh, your being with us and sharing so openly uh, with our audience. And I, I think what struck me about our conversation was the uh, I think the, the candor and the openness with which you answered all the questions and you sort of cleared air for a lot of people who've been thinking about how to build their business, how to go about sustaining their businesses. 
so I, I'm sure everybody who was listening to us found it very, very useful. So thank you very much for that, uh, Simon, for being with us today. Okay, you're welcome and good luck to everybody who was listening. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we've got Simon. I'm sorry, we, we cut you short. You were saying something. No, I think it, it, is it finished or? Yes, I, I think you were saying something and uh, we sort of. No, I, I just said good luck to everybody. <laughs> oh, right. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Wish you all the best, sir. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, so that last time I remember I forgot to pick the two lucky winners, but lesson learned. Let me just pick the two questions for the show today. Uh, I already have it. Um, uh, yeah, so this is one from Shraddha Panikar who asked question regarding sustainability and inclusion as a means for generating long-term profits. And Rajat, no, sorry, oh, my bad. Um, Give me a second. Yeah, and the second one is Mahesh, who asked about uh, his venture, that he's starting a new venture and what advice Simon would give to him. So congratulations, Shraddha. Congratulations, Mahesh. Uh, please send us your email ID uh, so we can ship the voucher to you. And thank you very much to everybody for listening in to us today. Before we close the show, a big thanks to our community support partner, Resultex, Ad Gali, Paul Writer, Netcore, and Shulini University for supporting us. Uh, again, a big thank you to our knowledge support partner, etbrandequity.com, for helping us take the message forward and wider to our audience. The next session we have is, uh, is on a very, very interesting and intriguing topic. It's called office politics. I'm not going to reveal much on that, but let me assure you, this is something that you really, really want to tune into and know the role of office politics in shaping your career. That's going to be an interesting one. Session by Nivin Postma, online September, 6.30 p.m. on Master Speak. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hope to see you back soon.